Hi guys, welcome to Pixie Nettery and I'm Pixie. If you don't know me yet, I'm custom doll artist. I'm sewing miniature clothes and crafting different tiny stuff. So if you're totally into that, I got some quality doll shit going on on my channel. Check it out after this video if you have a little bit of time in your pockets to absorb me doing magic with my doll creations. I'd highly appreciate it. But today it is another type of video. Still, it is doll related. Welcome to my Q&A video. Oh, and also speed paint video. And not just a regular one, but I'm drawing a character that I already made into a doll. The owner of this LC commissioned me to draw her character and who am I to miss such an opportunity to chill with my watercolors while answering your questions. I asked you guys to leave your questions in the community section of my channel and also write them in DM on my Instagram, so I can write a script for this video. And thank you so much that you did it, now this video for real will be interesting and informative, yay! You know, it was the hell I'm going to talk about in this speed paint video moment. And thank every one of you who checked the community tab. I'm posting there some questions to you, little notes and photos that you will not find anywhere, so if you're still not there, you're very welcome to join. If this video will be interesting to you, I'm going to make more of them in the future. So, before we are starting, let me introduce you to one of my cats. He is 11 years old, grumpy, sometimes playful and a total jerk of a cat, but still I love him no matter what, Tosia. Sure. Okay, we will gonna return to him later. Before I'm going to answer your questions about dolls, just a short description of what I'm gonna do while I'm gonna talk. It is my method of drawing illustrations. I make really crooked sketch on paper, then transfer it to PC and make a nice line art in Photoshop with my Wacom tablet. After that, I print out the final picture, trace everything onto the paper and color it with watercolors. I'm not calling this method the most reasonable, but it works out perfectly for me. I like the features of digital art, where I can edit any line the way I love it. And I adore traditional mediums to make pictures in colors because it is easier for me and I find it a more appealing option for myself when it comes to working with colors. So this is set and let's start our Q&A at last, oh my god, yeah. So the first one will be a bunch of questions, which I thought can be combined and I can answer them in a bulk, one by one. What got you into doll customization to begin with? Do you have a dream doll to work with? Or a favorite doll in general? What custom was the most challenging and which are you most proud of? Do you have any specific doll artists or illustrators who inspire you? So now let's roll this bulk. What got me into doll customization, you ask? The answer will be unusual. It is not about how doll customs are butterflies and unicorns, how chilling and relaxing this art and all of that. How I love crafting characters and create fashion. Ha! It is wild wild west, my dears. The roller coaster of emotions and hours of your time sewing a tiny piece of an outfit and everything. It is a pure, raw and sweaty skill pumper. All encompassing grit is what dragged me into doll customs. So imagine, Ukraine, early 2000s, I'm a small kidlin. I loved to play with Barbies and all these mass market dolls back then. I was a huge fan of dolls. I bought every magazine about Barbies, I saw extra articulated dolls in those magazines and I thought, oh damn, why no such Barbies are selling in my small town? They're so cool looking. The only articulated Barbies I had were those which were printed in commercial booklets I was able to get in my local toy store. So I played with what I had, dreaming about articulated dolls to have. Okay, time passed. At some point my mom said that I'm already too grown up to play with dolls and it is time to stop. And what teenager pig said then? Mom, I will never stop playing with dolls, huh? And I stopped. But just for some time. I was in my senior classes. It is 2007-2009 when I saw my first ball jointed dolls via the internet and I fell in love with them so dearly I thought that was it. I need one. Fuck Barbies. This is what I need. They are so anime-like, so human-like, so unbelievable to be even real. And my passion for dolls flared up with new force. I don't know how about everyone, so I'm only talking about myself. But you know in school you haven't that much money to buy a doll, aka toy, in an adult's perspective which costs hundreds of dollars. If you will try to reason to your parents why you need this doll, I bet they gonna fuck you up, mate. 
they are totally gonna fuck me up, no chance. They're having way more preferred options to spend this hella amount of money, thought I then. And again, the only thing I could do then is download all the internet, save every picture of BGD I liked and dream how I will get some money to buy one for myself. Also, I become an anime nerd and starting to draw my silly pictures in notebooks. Time passed. So, I'm student, I'm no longer living with my parents while getting my bachelor's degree. And I started to make my first small money from the scholarship, so I was able to save some money. My dream about BGD become closer. But you know, buying a doll isn't everything, right? BGDs are about face-up, clothes, accessories, wigs, eyes, and everything which costs more money, which I hadn't. I thought, oh, I'm an artist actually, huh? So, you're feeling now where it comes slowly, right? I am an artist, I will save some money and when I will buy BGD I will draw her face myself. I will save money on makeup. Oh my god, how naive I was. Exact this moment I discovered Nicole's dreams channel on YouTube, where Andrea, name of an artist, was painting faces for BGDs. And actually she's the first one who showed me the magic of doll repaints. I learned that drawing faces for dolls is not that easy and you can actually damage precious dolls with drawn materials or painting technique. Said that, I shite myself is saying nothing. Oh damn, I'm totally gonna destroy the doll with my lack of experience, I need something less expensive to begin with. And Andrea dropping face up stories 22 Monster High Draculaura. That's where it all begins. I knew about Monster High dolls, but I never was a fan. I thought their bodies are strange, their faces are too aggressive in matter of shapes and colors and back then I was into other stuff. Until I saw this video. Andrea showed me that factory toy actually can be a base just as BGD. It is a great tool and they are way cheaper. So it is perfect option to start practicing. So when I will have my BGD I will be so skillful, damn boy. It will be the best BGD ever for me. And I will save some money of course. Spoiler, no, it didn't happen. At the moment I already had some BGD face-up materials, because I was preparing myself for the BGD thing. I asked other BGD owners to send me their doll's heads so I can draw them face-ups for free, just to learn how to do it properly and not fuck up my doll. And I considered the Monster High option just an as opportunity to advance my skill further, because not that many people were willing to send their BGDs to a no-name doll artist with no skill. And Monster High is just right there at every toy store. It was 2013. I ordered my first BGD doll and it wasn't the one I wanted at first. It was brand Soul Doll and the name of the doll Joel D. And I was a sucker for Fairyland Active Line Girls, but okay. It was still a BGD I liked for some time. So closer to a due time, aka my first BGD arrival, I decided I need more practice. With my friend Bellary we went to a store to pick up our first Monster High dolls. I saw Catherine de Mau, she was only dropped onto the shelves of the stores back then. And you know I'm a huge worshipper of cats. Before Catherine I wasn't that sure if I even want to start with Monster Highs. So this cat conquered my heart, I still have her. But with no face already, I regret it endlessly, but it is a story for another time. And you guys, I was so scared to wipe her face for the first time, so this doll stayed untouched for almost half a year. I just looked at her and adored every feature of her. I continue watching Andrea's videos and absorb the knowledge. I saw that Monster High are different and it is totally something new, something beautiful, something I felt myself more and more interested in. I was on my winter holidays at my parents' house with my boyfriend when I repainted her. It was 2014. I started in Crimea and originally my home was in the Lugansk region. A year later, in 2015, I lost the ability to come back to both of these places, hopefully not forever. But this story is also for another time. A bit later, I still got my active line Fairyland doll and for years she was laying in the box because I was so deeply into Monster High repaints for a reason. I started to make my first money out of customs. Fortunately for me, they were on the top of popularity back then. And I found myself a quite skillful in that business. I was able to sustain myself by creating dolls for others. But generally, custom dolls became my getaway in all this situation around Ukraine in 2014 and next years. 
because I lost so much in this period starting from home ending with people I loved that I can say it was the beam of the light for me in all darkness. So that's how I started my custom dolls journey. Dolls were my passion always and I made them my hobby at first and then they became also my job. My favorite Monster High dolls are Catherine Demiao and Venus McFly Trap. The first one I bought for myself, the second one was a gift from my boyfriend. Also, I love some brands of BGDs. So, the next question is, do I have a dream doll to work with? And question from Medi, do you have any dream doll creations you wanted to make? I'm creating custom dolls already for almost a decade, I have huge list of characters and looks I want to make in that notebook. But I'm not the fastest artist out there, and there is a reason. I'm combining my commissioned dolls and ideas of other people's with my ideas. When those both meet each other, those are my dream dolls. When it comes to the specific doll I'm most comfortable working with, it doesn't matter to me that much. I'm open to trying new molds and shapes, but I do have my preference in matter of doll format. I like Monster High, Every After High, DC Supergirls, Disney doll faces and Descendants faces also my favs too. Those are the most usable bases for me. From time to time I'm also adding new brands to this list. Experimenting with dolls and materials is one of the most exciting parts of making dolls customs for me. What custom was the most challenging and which are you most proud of? Every custom doll in some way is a challenge, but of course, there are some that I'm proud of the most and those which were challenging AF. I'm proud of, of these original characters I made. It is Run Run and Catch You. I thought it would be cool to make an octopus tattooed pastel sailor Fuku anime inspired doll for Halloween. And later I made an antagonist for her, a dual colored white red girl with Halbert. I just love the details and I had plenty of fun making them. Those were the first such detailed dolls I ever made. It was just a next level custom doll skill for me. Also these Halloween dolls, Witch Summoner and her Little Demon Summon. They were sold as pair to one customer, what made me happy as hell. This Alice in Wonderland doll I made. I love her photo set. This panty doll from the anime Panty Stocking and Garter Belt. My Megumin doll, which I made as a gift to my boyfriend. From the recent It Is Hattering, Jinx doll, also next level details I performed. Love every one of these dearly. But as I said, every doll is a challenge in some way, because they are totally different. And I always learn some things with each new doll I create. Ok, the next question is, do you have any specific doll artists or illustrators who inspire you? And let's connect it with this question. What are your favorite and least favorite parts about doll customizing? And also what would you say are some of your biggest inspirations for your art? So, first, what are my biggest inspirations? I can divide my inspiration into a few directions. Those are specific themes and specific artists whose visual style I really like. When it comes to the themes, my main inspirations are pastel fashion, vintage fashion, fantasy and medieval clothes and designs, nature vibes, also music. I can listen to a song and the character just pop out from nowhere while I'm listening to it. Illustrators are... I will put their names on the screen so you can check them out. I don't know if I pronounced them right, but okay. Fifal, Glue Milo, Hikiyori, Julieta Hart, Kimisu Kimifu, Sakiza, Sakura Bell, Sibyline and doll artists. Those are actually shifting very often and I do not make dolls my main point of inspiration in the first place, just to find my own authenticity. You know, I follow a lot of doll artists, but I look at those more for technical aspect of the doll making process, to learn how other doll artists are doing their thing. I like watching doll making videos on YouTube myself, but I try not to absorb too much of their style features into my own art, just to have room for my ideas. Here are a few doll artists which are having a special place in my heart. Avonori, Dollhouse Cherry, Hello Marie, Oscar Magic Doll, The Ugliest Wife. Those just grab my attention in no time. I have much more of them actually, but this video will be in an eternity long if I will start to mention all of them. What are my least favorite parts of making doll customs? It is quite a short answer, because I mostly like making dolls, but there are still few processes which I don't like that much and I'd with pleasure skip it if I had this chance. The first one, I don't like working with hair. And it is no matter what material they are made of. I just don't like what control I have on hair locks, they are just always spreading around. The process is usually messy, even if I try to keep it organized. I don't like cutting hair, styling it, gluing it, preparing locks and so on, just so boring. 
The second one – cleaning and organizing my table after the project is done. It takes some time. I have specific places for each item I have for my doll customizing materials and usually it takes about half an hour for me to put everything back when project is done. Also very boring. But it is a vital necessity about which I will tell further in this video. The next question is what is your favorite part of the doll customization? Example, making wigs or making outfits? Do you prefer to make your own dolls based on what you like or do you prefer to make commissioned dolls instead? Ok, so, my favorite part of making dolls is sewing the outfits. I mean the actual process of assembling each part of the doll's clothing together. Also, when you put the finished look on the doll, it just comes to life even if the face isn't there. I like making small accessories and to plan out each detail of the future custom. I like to pick materials and colors for a specific idea. In other words, I like to make design of the character. I like to find some new techniques, figure out how I can make my ideas come to life, fiddle with the possible way of making specific item and so on. I find it quite interesting, because for me it is really hard to stay motivated by being occupied with monotonous and repeatable process for too long. I like to keep my brain busy. Yes, sometimes it can be too much if the task is too quirky, but eventually solution comes at the right time. I like that dolls keeps me curious. If we are talking about the whole process of making dolls, then I should admit I like switching the doll creating process to actually video editing. I can say that it will be the same forever, but currently I do really like making doll videos. Preferences such as like or don't like really depends on your current mood, your life situation, mental state, your current interests and thrives, and way more aspects. So if you are like doing something now or don't like it, it doesn't mean that it will be so forever. The second part of question is, I like to make dolls based on my ideas or commission dolls more? The answer is, it depends. Of course I like making my own ideas a lot, because I have all freedom in the world, what artist doesn't like it, right? But you know that many customers who commission dolls from me actually give me no less freedom to work on their projects. They came to me sometimes with just an idea or a very figurative sketch and told me something like, do whatever you like, I just want a doll that you will make. And those are the best customers. Love you guys. And sometimes I just feel like I not have much creativity going on, so I appreciate it when the customer has their own specific vision. Maybe I will add few details to make it pop, or adapt it to physics of the materials I'm using. Not every time it is possible to make something that drown on the picture into reality. So since dolls at the current point of my life my main income source, of course, I'm trying to make any projects I'm taking as comfortable for me as possible. So I pick not every commission, but only those which I can fulfill, which are interesting for me and if I see that we resonated with my client. It is no less important for me that I and my client will get results we both will be satisfied with. So answering the question, I like freedom no matter what doll I'm making. My idea or someone. It is important for me to be comfortable with the idea. Next question. Do you usually start with an idea and then pick a doll, or do you get inspired by the doll base? It is almost always the idea, but if I see a specific doll that caught my attention, I can figure out the idea based on the doll. And the last question for this video. How do you manage to get anything done with the cat in the house? Oh, and how do you organize your stashes? Crafting stashes are pure serotonin. About the cats. Oh, it was a total challenge some time ago. We have two cats at our home. Tosa our first and older cat and Simba our second and younger, former stray cat. And yeah, we have a sad story with fortunately good ending about Simba, specifically when he almost died because he ate the needle that I kept in my workspace. It was a year since we saved Simba from dying on the street, and I then already was able to develop my own table for working. The stashes question and story about my workspace I will keep for another time. So I kept a needle pad on the table and cats actually never paid attention to it. They never touched my items, so I wasn't even worried something like that could ever happen. I counted my needles every time after finishing the work, because I've dropped them on the floor from time to time and actually this was problem for me. The other day I noticed that I lost one needle again. Maybe I dropped it, I thought. I hadn't found it no matter how hard I was looking for it. The next day the second of the two needles was gone from the pet and I knew I hadn't dropped it. Previously I paid extra attention to winding up the thread of this needle onto the pet to avoid losing it. And then I had a shadow of uncertainty that maybe one of the cats actually ate it. It was the only logical answer back then, because I saw no other options for this to happen. And damn, unfortunately, I was so right. 
The next day, second needle was lost, let's say, the first needle just popped out from the Simba naturally, and we had to check his insides immediately, because we still have another missing needle. We made an x-ray of him the exact same day when we discovered first needle. And here is the result, yeah. This bright white stripe is second needle. The same day our wet made Simba a surgery. Here is how Simba looked when we just bring him to the wet. Very scared and stressed out. Fortunately, doctor took out the needle out and here it is. With this dank thread. He said that sometimes cats can eat such things because it reminds them of grass or something. They start to eat the thread and then everything that comes with it because they just can't stop and spit it out. For a month Simba had to recover and wear this fancy blue body cover to protect his scar on the belly. And here is healed scar. We now sometimes call Simba a wallet because of this scar. Doctor had to open him literally like a wallet. So starting from this time I never keep anything small or potentially dangerous on my workspace. And try to keep everything behind the shut doors or covered in organizer to avoid anything like that happening ever again in the future. At first it was hard because I hadn't much space and kept everything in paper boxes. But it was 4 or 5 years ago so now I have my shit very well organized and hidden. It may sound too complex but this is vital habit that is necessary with animals at home. And here is the end of this video guys. I still have unanswered questions and I will for sure answer them in my next Q&A video. I just had time run out too fast in this one so please stay tuned for more. I hope this video was interesting for you. Write me in the comments maybe you want to know anything else. As you can see this art process came to an end as well. And I hope that my customer will receive her doll soon with this cute art I draw for her. If you like such format of the video let me know. It was really fun to make. Thank you guys for staying here with me today. But it is time for me to say... Have a nice day guys, see you in my next videos, bye!